Uh, good morning and welcome to the seventh meeting of the committee in 2019. Um, I'd like to, remem to remind members and the public to turn off any mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers during the meeting should ensure they are switched to silent. Uh, the first item of business on the agenda today is an evidence session on the report No Deal Brexit – Economic Implications for Scotland by the Chief Economic Advisor. I would like to welcome Dr Gary Gillespie, who is the Chief Economic Advisor, and Simon Fuller, who is Deputy Director, Economic Analysis of the Scottish Government, and welcome you both to the meeting this morning. I understand Mr Gillespie would like to make an opening statement, and I invite him to do so. OK, thank you very much, Convener. It's a pleasure to come along this morning and give evidence on the... Sorry, is that... that that's fine. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's fine. Give evidence on the report. I'd like to just make some opening remarks to cover some background to the analysis, if I can. What is different to No Deal relative to the earlier work? And I'll say a little bit about why we chose the particular scenarios okay. and finally what the results imply. I'll take a few minutes, though, because yes. obviously we'll follow up with, with questions. So, firstly, on the background to the analysis, this draws on work that we've done within government over the last two years. Uh, it draws on external analysis as well. And in a sense, it presents the paper was produced in a way to try and articulate in a clear, a clear and neutral way the impact and transmission channels through which a no deal Brexit would impact. So it's so it's based it draws on two years' work, a lot of our analysis and my my personal and professional judgment in terms of the results. Now, so what's different from this analysis relative to what we previously published, the work that was published in Scotland's place in Europe and other places? And the difference really is that in all of that work, the central assumption was that there would be an orderly transition, that you would move from EU exit into a different arrangement, but it would be done through an orderly, uh, an orderly basis. And that's really the central central difference. So what, what that modelling does is essentially says that over a 15-year period, the growth in the economy will be lower due to leaving the EU, irrespective of what arrangements you get to. But it's a, the transition is a managed transition, and the impacts are over a, over a period. So it's not immediate in the terms of a, a negative impact or recession. Whereas with, with no deal, essentially, what you're focusing on is, is alongside the kind of long-term structural changes, you've got the immediacy of the impacts. And I'll say a little bit more about that when we get on to the, the papers. So the two scenarios that we outline in the paper essentially reflect, scenario one is a short supply side shock to the economy. So all what that tries to capture is this notion that the economy is functioning well and you have a disruption and that reduction can reflect legal, regulatory, transport, logistical challenges. And essentially, that, that, that restriction impacts on how the economy outputs. So if you think back to the early 70s when we had power strikes, OBR used that as an analogy to say the economy was working in a three-day week. That's a kind of classic supply-side shock. Or extreme events where you have bad weather, which impacts the flow of goods within the economy. So that was that was a kind of supply side scenario one show. Scenario two essentially says, well, in that initial scenario, we view we view that as a kind of short, sharp shock with the economy recovering. When you then go into scenario two, you're looking at this being more prolonged and starting to impact on business cash flows, household confidence, and starting to impact on the demand side of the economy. And that brings that brings with it a set of additional impacts and prolongs the impact of that. So that was that was why we did scenarios one and two, um, and that was why they're kind of set out as projections because there's uncertainty around how the final form of Brexit will materialise and what the impact will be across a range of a range of sectors. So, so essentially, Brexit represents a terms of trade change to the economy. If you, that's how we would view it in economic terms. You're changing the basis for how, for how the economy operates. Now, finally, if I just say a little bit about the results. So the, the methodology and the results that we set out are very similar to other work, both done by the Bank of England and the UK government. Uh, the results which we published on the 21st of February, as I said, bring all of that 
bring all of that together, set out the kind of channels, transmission mechanisms for how this would impact in the economy and the range of scenarios. So, so to get to the kind of the, the, the key messages from the analysis is uh, what we are saying is that despite kind of the best government mitigation or other mitigation, no deal will impact in a, a sharp shock to the economy. It will lead to output falling. Uh, and the range within the scenarios that we've modelled is from GDP growth falling in Scotland by 2.5 to 7 per cent. That we, with that type of shock, you would see that manifest itself in the labour market. We would see unemployment from its record low levels at the minute beginning to rise as firms respond to the challenge of reduced demand, supplies and cash flows. And on the macro, wider macro side, we see exchange rates, inflation, migration, exports and FDI all being impacted by this. So it's quite quite a significant shock. The, our results are broadly in line with, with the UK. Their worst case scenario for no deal is 9.3% reduction, which is over a, a longer time period. And the range for their for the government's uh, deal is within a negative 2.5 to 3.9 percent. So essentially, what you're what you're seeing here is there's a con a consensus across the analysis, certainly the published analysis from the UK and the Bank of England and the Scottish government, that Brexit will be will have a negative impact on the economy. There's a debate around different transmission mechanisms and the impact of different deals. So f just, just to say finally, so the intention of this work was to set out clearly the channels, potential impacts, range of impacts, so that we could think about how, how the government would respond to that and, and also to engage the wider business sector and the potential impacts of this. The, the final thing I haven't mentioned is just to say, and I'm sure we'll come on to this, is that the impacts of Brexit, unlike the previous recession, are likely to have a sectoral and geographical focus that will be different. And that reflects the nature of the, the shock and the types of impacts that it will transmit. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, can I ask whether other scenarios that you could have um, analysed, you chose two that you've outlined for us this morning, were there other um, options that could have been discussed? And also the... Fraser of Allender Institute, who have written a blog on the report, have emphasised that it's um, that it's not a forecast. Uh, they've made clear distinction between its scenarios rather than forecasts. So, so I'm interested in, you have kind of briefly referred to how the work would be taken forward, what the purpose of the report is, but can we say why these scenarios were chosen and what the expectation is that the report can achieve? Yeah, so, so on, on the scenario point, it's interesting, the, the UK government report that was published last week is based on scenarios as well. So they aren't forecasts and they're not, they can't be forecasts because you can't be certain about this given the range and complexity of variables. So what we've, if I go back to what I was trying to outline about scenario one and two, what we are, what we are doing is setting out a kind of a range from a minimalist short shock that would impact predominantly the supply side. So if you think about logistics, transport, uh, constraints on business, new administration, costs, adjustments, which could be which, which could be short term, and the economy comes back to a to a wider, fuller effect it transmits to the economy. So, in a sense, you've got a range of scenarios, and within there, there could be different there could be different impacts. Some sectors may be less impacted, other sectors more so. The demand side could be less important or more important. So within that range, so in a sense, you could view the scenarios as two endpoints, scenario one, scenario two, rather than that. Uh, on your question about um, other scenarios possible, um, I'd be interested in your views about maybe what, what else we could have modelled. I think we've tried to do it from an economic perspective, thinking about the supply side, the demand side, and then how it come, comes together. So uh, and the articulation of the kind of scenario one and two is really try to, to try and help people understand uh, the different impacts of different shocks. And that was really for thinking about how we would respond to those shocks and to think about how that would that would impact in the business community. So, so 
so there's so I suppose there is potentially other scenarios you could do, but I think they're broadly all covered within that within that range. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, could I maybe just ask a question about mitigation? Um, that's maybe not the purpose of the report to consider mitigation, but you've outlined the potential impact of a no deal Brexit. Um, is consideration given to mitigation policies brought in by planning by the Scottish Government or the UK Government? And you will be aware of the report we've had um, from Tony Mackay, um, Professor of Economics. And as part of that, um, he suggests that there are perhaps mitigation you've not considered where mitigation could be brought in. The report almost assumes that these scenarios happen if there's no action taken by Scottish Government or UK Government or insufficient action taken. And he suggests things like the role of the Bank of England, where that would fit into any of these scenarios. Um, so I suppose it's asking where, what kind of mitigation you feel the Scottish Government or UK Government are currently undertaking for a no-deal scenario or should be taken. OK, so, so I think on the... On the mitigation point, um, I think we're consistent with the UK government analysis that essentially says that uh, despite government mitigation, no deal will have a significant impact in a number of areas. So essentially there's an admission that you can't mitigate the full impact of this. And the reasons for that is, is it's not a unilateral thing you're dealing with. It requires businesses to be prepared. It requires re reciprocal arrangements from the EU and changes to customs and procedures. So it's not it's not something that you, that's in the gift of the UK or, or Scottish government to fully to fully mitigate. I think the point around what what the policy response. I think that's what Professor Mackay is getting at. What would be the policy response in the advent of a No Deal, and would that essentially shift? The projections from the worst case closer to the to the better case it's probably worth so so in, in thinking about that w w the immediate response in thinking about that the immediate response to government uh, is to think about the supply side constraints is to think about what businesses need to function new information new processes customs if there's logistical shocks how you ease those uh, the UK government paper also cites the the bottleneck in terms of transport links into the UK. So you would that would be your initial focus, and that's actually consistent with the supply side, the scenario one where we see that as a, a short, sharp shock with the economy coming back. So implicit in that scenario, there's some mitigation. The obviously when you get into a full blown shock, supply and demand, then there's a role for the Bank of England and the Treasury and others in terms of stimulating the economy. It's probably worth saying that the, the so the the last financial crisis that led to a major recession, 2008-9, output at the UK level fell by over 6%. Unemployment in Scotland increased from 4 to over 8%. And there was a massive response from government at that. If you think, if you remember, we had uh, interest rates cut overnight practically from four and a half to half a percent. There was a quantitative, quantitative easing programme which essentially pumped money into the economy through the banks. There was reductions in VAT for a short period to stimulate uh, consumer confidence. So alongside a, a, a global uh, stimulus that was that was being coordinated to support the banks. So, so a government response will mitigate some of the impacts but I, I, you, you couldn't model it in this context. This is done purely to set out the transmission mechanisms and how the, those would impact on the economy. And the evidence from previous recessions is is that governments are governments can't fully mitigate this. Uh, there's natural business cycle issues that will come in through this, and the government can't fully fully respond to that. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll pass over to Ross Greer. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'd like to uh, move on to trade, but just before I do that, I'd like to uh, pick up on the issue around uh, employment that uh, Dr Gillespie raised. Obviously, anyone would expect uh, an economic shock to result in more unemployment, but there's the other side of that, which is a rise in underemployment that we saw off the back of the, the last economic crisis, more people in part-time work, in precarious work, in low-wage work. Have you done any modelling around the impact that that would have when people are still in work. So the headline unemployment figure uh, has not risen particularly high, but they've got far less spending power than they would have otherwise had. Yeah, so, so, so just to be clear, underemployment is those in work that want to work more hours. And you're right, we've seen that um, 
increased substantially during the last financial crisis. And even as the headline unemployment rate came back down, underemployment was slow. The under underemployment rate now is back to is broadly back to where it was at pre-recession levels. Uh, so, but it's an important point because that's that would be the mechanism, I think, for how the labour market would be impacted. So people on more flexible contracts uh, in the face of uh, cash flow or business issues, firms would start reducing hours for people. And essentially, a more flexible labour market means that the headline rate may not rise as quickly as we forecast, but you'll, you'll pick up an underemployment and people starting to, starting to demand... Uh, or lose hours in that in that context. But on your specific question, we haven't modelled under underemployment at this stage, but there's, it's correlated to the unemployment rate essentially, and we've seen that from the previous recession. Right, thank you. Um, and to move on to um, issues of trade, there's been uh, quite a bit of coverage recently of the UK government's struggles in trying to roll over the trade deals that the European Union has. 69 key deals that, that have been highlighted. I think of those, they've rolled over. Eight at the moment, nine if you count the deal with the Palestinian uh, Authority. Um, those deals vary. I mean, the, the Swiss one is significant enough. That's about eight billion pounds worth of UK imports and six and a half billion of, of exports. But the others are Madagascar, thirty million pound of imports, uh, nineteen million pounds of uh, exports. Have you done any modelling, and, and will you continue with live modelling um, of the deals that the UK government does manage to roll over and the impact they have on Scotland? Because, as, as you said, there's significant yeah. geographical and sectoral differences here. Yeah. So I think ju just to give you a, a flavour, so the, the modelling and work that we looked at essentially looked at what would be the implications of leaving the EU over a 15-year period. And within that, we looked at the evidence from the UK, National Institute and other bodies for what would be the likely impact in trade with the EU, productivity, FTI, etc. So in that sense, what, what we essentially model is reductions to the EU. Now, obviously, there's a broader sense of trade agreements which are integral to the EU schedule with the WTO and their, their own agreements. We haven't modelled them in detail. Uh, the, they're implicit in the, in the kind of dislocation that you would, that you would have. And, and it's fair to say the UK, the UK government uh, cites, the, cites in their own paper that was published last week that the, the falling off of some of these trade deals is a real risk for some sectors of the economy. I think they say the, they concede that the deal with Japan won't be ready in that time, and that, that would obviously have implications for that. And uh, the immediate impact of these deals falling is the is is the is the kind of basis for the trade and and the arrangements around tariffs and other things. So so we haven't modelled that yet, but it's something we'll continue to look at. There have uh, been a, a, a number of suggestions that um, as uh, particular deals are, are not rolled over, even the uh, trading relationship with the European Union is disrupted, that uh, UK um, exports would obviously struggle in that regard, but so would inputs. The, the examples that are typically used are around uh, food, where there would be uh, certain foods that you would expect far less of that to be coming into the UK, but certain foods produced here that we would simply export less of. Have you done um, any modelling of the perhaps the, the compensation effect there where uh, I think some of the, the tabloids have essentially put it that we would just have to start eating more salmon here, for example. Yep, so, so we haven't modelled that, but there's been work done internally looking at the basis through which you could uh, essentially we call it import substitution if you've got goods that you can no longer get to market, the ability to supply them into that market. What we say in the paper, in a sense, is based on the analysis and the impacts of... Uh, of EU's exports could fall up to by up to 20%. But correspondingly, alongside that, imports would fall as well. So if there's, if there's issues at the border or customs, it would work two ways. And essentially, that would provide an opportunity for some goods to be supplied locally. But, but, but it's, not as, it's not as straightforward as... Uh, it's really for... That's for businesses and firms to think about uh, their markets, their opportunities internal. If you think about the food industry in the UK, it's done through the supermarkets wholesale. It's very, um, it's very logistically based in terms of how inputs come in, 
and goods are made. So it's, there would need to be significant changes to that model. Uh, and just finally, what ongoing work will you be doing? You, you like everyone else, are a hostage to fortune with everything that you publish at the moment and the significant changes that happen week by week and day by day in this process. Um, what work will you be doing going forward to uh, adapt uh, any of the, the projections that uh, you have already made on the basis of uh, what direction we could be heading in? Yeah, so, so I think uh, we're 29th of March is three weeks tomorrow. So in, in that sense, it's probably futile to do more modelling of impacts. We set out two scenarios that are quite particularly grave, I think, in terms of the potential impacts. And really for us then, it's looking at what the final shape of, of EU exit takes. And I, I mention that because there could be... Uh, there could be concessions for some sectors over a transitionary period uh, based on last minute deals. But essentially, I think the key thing and in my role as chief economic advisor is to is to look at actually what happens immediately after and and use our intelligence data analysis to pick up and and kind of verify or not the types of transmission mechanisms that we think are impacting. Uh, so w w we're thinking about how we monitor in real time the, p the potential changes that will impact the economy through the firm base, through transport, logistics, confidence, so that we are in a better position to advise ministers and think about what response you would put in place at different times. Because uh, the immediate resilience work within the Scottish Government is obviously, f is obviously focused on the major resilience challenges. The economy is part of that, but the economy will, will, will lag the, the initial impacts. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Annabel Ewing. Hey, thank you, uh, and good morning, and thank you for coming in. Um, I, I'm wanting to turn to the issue of migration, and as we know, all of Scotland's population growth over the next 10 years is expected to come from migration, and therefore any significant impacts on that would presumably have other significant impacts in terms of our economy. So I just wonder, in terms of the no-deal uh, scenario, uh, what uh, impact uh, you understand that that would have on international net migration? Yep. So, so, I, so I would agree entirely that the, on net migration, what we've assumed in the paper, essentially Scotland benefits at the moment from around just over 13 thousand migrants a year coming into the economy. Uh, we've we've done previous analysis that shows the the benefits of migrants in terms of enhancing the labour supply and the contribution they make. I think your point about uh, the impact on the working age population and also the broader declining population. We have local authority areas in Scotland at the moment with declining population. So Migration, first and foremost, is really important for uh, for your population base. Secondly, really important for your working age population. And thirdly, a, a, a part that's often missed is there's a kind of source of demand in the economy as well. If you look at the performance of the UK and Scottish economies over the last 15 years, a, part, a, a substantial part of that growth differential just reflects differences in the population growth. So the, the size of the UK economy, or the rest of the UK economy, is expanding, expanding more. But I think your point around what we would, what, what would no deal uh, impact on migrants? Well, we know from the last, the evidence over the last couple of years that the the number of migrants is is starting to reduce coming into the the UK and Scotland. We know that the depreciation in sterling has a negative impact on the attractiveness of the UK and Scotland for migrants. And we know that the, the migrant population is really important for certain sectors of the economy, and they bring particular skills, uh, which, which we wouldn't necessarily be able to replace quickly. It's interesting that the Scottish Fiscal Commission and their forecasts really have a much more pessimistic view about the working age population and how that will constrain growth in Scotland. And that's really driven by uh, assumptions around less migrants uh, and that ability to do. But maybe I'll, I'll let Simon come in if you want to add anything about the modelling work. Yes, so um, 
On your point about sort of the longer term impacts and such like, we published some analysis last year looking at what different migration levels could have for Scotland's economy in the long term. And we essentially used as a baseline a scenario where Scotland was remaining in the EU, and then we then looked to see, okay, what if EU migration fell by 50%, and what if it fell by a level by a level which would be required to achieve the UK government's then target of getting migration to the tens of thousands. And what that showed was that if you had a 50% fall in EU migration, you'd be looking at Scotland's economy being about 6% smaller by 2040 than would otherwise be the case if migration continued at the levels we've seen over the past five to six years. So that would mean GDP of about six to seven billion lower, and obviously feeding through to tax revenues of, as well of being about maybe two, three billion pounds lower. So in the longer term, it is a real key driver for overall output and public sector revenue growth in Scotland. I think the only final thing I'd add to that is, and sometimes when we're talking about migration levels, it's not just the fact that migration boosts your overall labour supply, it's also obviously a fact they bring in very discrete skills, very specialist skills, and also allow your economy to basically be much more connected and networked into the wider international economy. So it's very much more than just the totality of migrants in Scotland. It's also about sort of the wider economic benefits and impact they have on Scotland. Well, <clears throat> indeed, and it is important when we talk about migration to remember uh, that uh, the, there are the other issues aside from the direct issues involved. And in that regard, the committee had the opportunity to have a discussion with Professor Manning of the Migration Advisory Committee some weeks ago now. And um, I think many committee members were quite surprised, is one word, that um, on questioning he conceded that there had been no specific modelling uh, as regards their work in terms of the position in Scotland. And I think we all find that, or many of us find that rather surprising. I mean, were you aware of, because th their work fed into the UK government's policy paper, were you aware if you've been doing work as far as Scotland is concerned that there was this yeah. development in, in terms of Westminster, but that it had taken really no account of the Scottish position? And indeed, moreover, Professor Manning seemed to indicate that uh, in terms of uh, the, the overarching concern from his perspective of pushing wage, wage levels up, that you could then just see other sectors go to the wall, uh, which may have sadly lower wages, but within contexts that are well understood, including in Scotland, agriculture and um, tourism. And they seem to be dispensable in terms of this new shining approach to, to life as we know it. Were you aware when you were working on your various papers, including this paper we're looking at today, that there was this approach going on uh, from Westminster. Yeah. So we were aware that there was a there was a a, a report being being comp compiled around that issue, and I believe though I need to check that actually the work that we done was actually provided to the committee uh, through our ministers around uh, the impact in Scotland, the the different view of migration, the extent to which the 180,000 EU workers, whatever, and the sectors and what they, they contribute. So I think that was shared with them. I'm, I'm almost certain. Has Manning ever come to you? And no, I never to spoke to mm. Professor Marlin, no. What about you, Mr Fuller, did no. Professor? No. That's a pity, because perhaps that could have helped inform the UK government's position. Thank you, Convener. Uh, thank you. Um, Tavish Scott. Yeah, thank you. I wonder if I could go back, uh, thank you very much, Convener, to um, Dr Gillespie, your earlier points that you made in your introductory remarks about the um, measures taken in the context of the two scenarios you've painted out in these in these papers. Uh, there's a plan, I take it, for both scenarios, a government plan. Yes, yes. And we have we have we seen that? So let me explain. Let me try and explain a, a little bit around the the plan. So in setting out the scenarios, you're setting out scenarios so that you can understand the channels and transmission mechanisms through which. The, the, this will impact in the economy. Uh, you can then look at and say, well, what, what's the role of government? Can government mitigate that? Where, where is government's focus best placed? So if you take, for instance, uh, if it's logistical, if it's a customs issue at the port, then you need to, if it's a, so take it's a customs issue at the port that you don't have inspection ports in place, that so you don't have the right customs then, the government response to that would be to try and enhance that capacity. 
if it's an impact at the firm level where firms don't have the information or knowledge or understanding of what being a, th a third country uh, trader now implies, then that's a different type of support. That's information, that's uh, maybe new systems, trying to enable firms to understand the implications of that. If it's, um, I mean, I appreciate there's all these things you're describing yeah. in context, but so is there a plan? Can, can I see a published plan of all these different scenarios? Because it's all very well doing scenarios, but unless there's then a plan that business can respond to and feed into, uh, we can have all the economists we like in the world, but yeah. you know, people need to get on with their business on the whatever day this happens on. Yeah, so, so I suppose your question about a plan is, is there a plan? There's, there's a plan in place, but the, the, the key thing about the plan is that the plan can't mitigate across all of these areas. And it's important to think about the government, any response. So the, the reason I was trying to give you the, the sense of the channels is that this is so complicated and multivaried that the government wouldn't be able to respond across these, sure. all of these, sure. all of these different areas. And actually the, the timing of when you would respond would obviously reflect what's actually happening on the ground. So you would have to respond in real time. So you can plan. You can plan for uh, logistics. You can plan for extra customs officials. You can plan for engaging the the enterprise base. You can plan for a number of issues. But until you actually have to put that plan into place, it's not. It's not really that. It, it, until you actually know what you're mitigating against, I suppose that's the point. Uh, no, I, I think I nearly understand that, except that um, in, a, in a logical uh, logical order of things, I assume that policy construction in the government is to have the scenarios that you've um, articulated this morning, or articulated, I should rather say, in this paper, and then for policy makers in the government to draw up the plan that's going to, do, that's going to deal with both those scenarios. Yes. Yeah, yes. And that's been done? Yeah. And that's published? Yeah, so p part of the reason for... Uh, part of the our desire to publish this analysis was to try... So we'd spoken to local government about this analysis. We've spoken to our enterprise agencies. We've been presenting this work to ministers within government. Yeah, but exactly. the point of putting out the scenarios and central assumptions is to, to enable people to think about how would you respond to that. So Indeed, take, and I think people are doing that. I'm asking what the government's doing. I think all these other parties are absolutely doing that. But so that the agencies are part of the government, so Skills <laughs> Development it's Scotland interesting, interesting uh, observation. Would, would be part of any government response. Yeah. Scottish Enterprise would be part of any government response. Government, yeah. Transport Scotland yeah. would be part of any government response. Yeah. Uh, and individual cabinet secretaries have, are, are obviously concerned with their own particular issues and are raising issues with UK ministers around the impacts in their particular sector. So it's it's not, uh, there's not a magic lever that the Scottish Government pulls. It would need to be coordinated with the UK as well. Mm -hmm. Of course it would be, but again, I'm asking, where is the, uh, where is the published plan? So there's no published plan as of no, yet. No, there's no published plan. But there's no published plan at the UK level either. No. No, so, indeed, one of the criticisms we're all making of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what you, what you can, what we've heard from the UK is that the, the Bank of England uh, will bring forward particular measures, um, but, but we haven't really heard much else around what, what a plan would be. OK, um, just can I ask you, um, on your conclusions, the final paragraph of your conclusion says the agriculture, food and fishing sectors are among those who have a particularly high level of exposure under a no-deal Brexit. I couldn't agree more. Um, what do you think the impact is on fishing? So, so let me explain why we... So those sectors, the sectoral analysis, first and foremost, is based on what sectors we think will be most impacted by no-deal. So obviously... Uh, Fishing, agriculture, uh, have particular specific arrangements within the EU at the moment. So, so in that sense, they are part of this of this impact. It's on the fishing side. It's more nuanced because obviously we have within that sector your fish processing as well, and the arrangements are much more are much more compli complicated. But essentially, for that sector in particular, there's a real concern that there'll be a major dislocation. That actually the, the processing sector, do you mean? Yeah, processing and the landing sector, because there's real issues about how you get uh, goods to market. And if you think about a frictionless market at the minute, and if you think about e introducing new export health certificates for different elements of the fish sector, and the processing impact that that would have. So that's why that sector, 
along with agriculture and other sectors, are high-risk no-deal sectors. They were also identified in the Bank of England work and other work as being sectors that would be really, really impacted by this. Now, I think where your question is going is, in a sense, is maybe in a new, a new arrangement out with the EU. Uh, could the fisheries sector be benefit in Scotland? Is that is that where your thinking is? <laughs> I think it's important to recognise the difference. I, I, I'm not here to um, make statements about what I think. I'm here to yeah. ask questions. Okay. That's kind of normally I even, how I understand parliamentary committees work. Okay. My point is, um, the question I'm asking is, I, I, I'd rather this paper had reflected that if you're going to talk about fishing, you're assuming it's all bad. That's the implication of this paper. That's not the case. No, no, I, I think... So, uh, th so I think there's a level of detail that you're alluding to within each of these sectors. Mm -hmm. So, so for fishing, uh, fishing certainly a sector that would be impacted. Over over what time period it would become good is a different a different question. So I'm not. Uh, th this is a an, ass an economic assessment at the macro level, including sectors. Now within ev within every sector. Um, in my opening remarks, I made the point that essentially EU exit reflects changes to the terms of trade for sectors across the economy. And essentially, the long term modelling shows that sectors will adjust and other sectors will, will, will emerge. But the, 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 the fishing sector is one sector that will be impacted. OK, it's just that in the, in the conclusion, that there, only, there are only three sectors that your conclusion. Um, specifically mentions, I think you're right on agriculture and food. I just think to, to simply say, fi to, to lump fishing in uh, as you have, just to say it's all bad, is, is not true. I mean, that's, you, you absolutely cannot say that. It doesn't matter what I think. Yeah. Okay. Don't get me wrong. It doesn't yeah. matter what I think. It's just that to say the catching sector will be, in effect, you will imply in, in this report that the catching sector will be adversely affected. You don't know that. No, but, but I suppose in a sense, again... I think you're, you're right about agriculture. If, I absolutely if, know that's true on agriculture, but not on fishing. Yeah, well, we will know with the evidence on that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Alexander Stewart. Thank you very much. We've talked about this morning the, the UK and the Scottish Government putting together uh, the guidelines. And when you're looking at, at local authorities, uh, many local authorities already put in some scenario planning. Uh, they've also talked about some of the contingencies that they require uh, to have in place to ensure that some of their sectors and some of the parts are and the departments within local authority are, are, are some way protected, depending on if there is to be a, a no-deal scenario. So can I ask you to broaden out a little bit and give us a, a flavour of what authorities across Scotland uh, do you think? Uh, and do you believe that there is sufficient uh, preparation uh, being done within these local authorities uh, to mitigate and to manage a, a no-deal situation if and when it occurs? OK, so, so I think it's fair to say that the, the paper which we published was about the economic impacts of No Deal, and we didn't set out the uh, the policy response and readiness of local authorities or or the Scottish government. That wasn't part of the analysis. What we what we do know is that local authorities are preparing the the resilience committee that the has been set up operates across Scotland, involves local authorities, and essentially local authorities are part of any response. And they're looking at it across their their workforce, the services that they, they deliver, the provisions that they have to provide, and also their specific roles are around environment, health checks, and, and things that w would be impacted on that basis. But it's it's worth saying that the, the no deal has an immediacy of impact. And essentially, until probably September last year, the, the central assumption would be that there would be a, a deal of sorts and a transition period, mm -hmm. which would essentially mean that everything would stay as it is until through into uh, January 20, 2021 or whatever. So there's a, there's a real challenge for... There's a real challenge, capacity and others, for sectors and parts of government to respond to something that potentially is coming so quickly. But as I've said, you know, the local government already are going through this whole process uh, on uh, 
uh, a date uh, three weeks' time, hence, if, that, if we, we do not find ourselves in that situation. Uh, do you anticipate a massive knock-on effect on local government, or, or do you think that it will take some time for it to filter through? Because, obviously, the, the social and health care sectors are one of the biggest parts of local government. Uh, at the moment, they're working uh, to their capacity and yeah. doing all they can. Uh, uh, an implication for no deal may have an implication to staffing levels, uh, but that's not going to be imminent. Yeah. Uh, it will happen through time. Uh, but if they have already got scenarios and contingency plans in place, uh, then that, that we, we may all be mitigated for that one sector uh, within local government. Uh, economic development is another sector that local government deal with. Uh, but once again, that may take time for that to manage, uh, uh, for, for situations to occur. Uh, and, and other sectors support that, whether it's the Small Business Federation or the Chamber of Commerce, other organisations uh, uh, that come into that whole process. So, so there, there, there is an impact that you identify may well take place, uh, but that impact, uh, how would that impact be managed in the timescale, uh, in six months, a year or whatever, uh, 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 where, where, where there would be a crisis, because we've heard in other sectors that the, the crisis would happen uh, nearly immediately uh, uh, in, in yeah. some of the, uh, uh, the, the, the scenarios that people have, have tried to uh, bring forward and say that would be the case. So, uh, so again, going back to the, the, the point, I think I made more rem remarks around there would be a sectoral and a geographical impact, and that essentially not all impacts would happen immediately, and it would happen at different okay. different times. So if you think about, uh, I think you mentioned health and social care. Mm -hmm. So the, the labour market in Scotland at the moment, uh, unemployment's under 100,000. <coughs> There's real pressure around... Uh, Getting people into those sectors to provide the to provide the services, so the the so that's that's unlikely to change immediately, yeah. unless unless there's a there's a, a real fall in the the migrant labour, um, which could have an impact in that in that type of provision into that into that sector, on the on the economic development business ready. Business readiness, business gateway is obviously a part of the the wider enterprise system, and they're connected into readiness work that's been done with Scottish Enterprise and others around thinking about how to respond to the business base. So, so again, the point is that, that those impacts may not happen immediately. The business impacts could be more front loaded, yes. uh, depending on particular sectors and how quickly our dislocated sectors sectors become. It's worth. I mean, if you think back to the last financial crisis, we had um, we had a relative lag, maybe about three, four months before unemployment in Scotland really started to rise. Mm -hmm. um, we, and then we had a period where it rose from around four to over eight percent over a period of about around eleven months, and then it stayed at that level for a period before coming back down. So, so there's lags. I think in my earlier response to Mr uh, Greer, um, companies will respond through cutting hours first and maintaining people within within the business, uh, maintaining their skills, and then it comes to a point where if it's structural change that's needed, then you see the increase in demand, but uh, you see the impact of that through the wider, wider labour supply. And, and a number of local authorities have been awarded good financial management. Uh, by Audit Scotland and others who, who come in and, and look at their, their scenarios and how they're planning and how they're processing. There's a number of local authorities that find themselves not in that situation. They find themselves in a very difficult situation financially. So a, a no-deal situation would have a massive impact potentially on some of these local authorities that do not have that resilience and do not have that resource uh, to pull upon that other local authorities may have uh, as a cushion uh, going forward in this whole process. Do you have any views on that? Well, only in the sense that if you take the no-deal scenario to its, to its fullest extent and that you have the channels that we've identified, particularly the rising unemployment, falling output, uh, more stress in the business sector, yeah. then all of that will feed through to uh, public finances as well. And in that sense, you will you will have impacts. It's a it's 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 a and it would be a totally different type of response that would be required from local government, from all f all forms of government. Mm -hmm. you, you're in a you're in a sense a different you're in a different um, a ballpark, a different scenario 
Uh, but are, are they are they in a worse situation or a better situation in some other sectors? Then, is uh, is is local government uh, uh, in a a dire need or a dire situation in comparison? Uh, uh, will it have the biggest impact upon across the the services and provided that they provide locally to communities? Mm, I mean, I, I couldn't really comment on the the provision of the different local authorities for their th their own services. What I would say is the local authorities are obviously key providers of services, and they'd be part of any response. Uh, we've identified in the paper local authorities that we we ranked as being the most potentially the most uh, impact. That was and, and and that was that was more on on workforce. That was rather that, than financial. Yeah, that was based on workforce, and that was based on the Bank of England's No Deal uh, sectors most likely to be, to be impacted affected. in No Deal, and it was based on the proportion of that employment in those sectors by a local authority. Mm -hmm. Obviously, people commute in and out of local authorities, mm -hmm. so it was trying to get the. I was trying to put an, a handle on the economic dislocation that could happen within those sectors, and and in a sense the. The, the sectoral pattern of that reflects where those sectors are. It's the north, northeast, and some central belt as well. So, um, where the population is, or, or where the population isn't, depending yeah. on where you can find yeah. that, because uh, they, they they bring in different uh, aspects to whether they can cope uh, with the scenarios or, or not, as the case may be. Well, in a sense, it's so that I suppose there's different different ways you can view this. If it's the if it's an economic shock impact in those sectors, uh, then it's a it's a, a response that's required beyond the local authority. Sure. Really, uh, if it's local authority public services, it's a different thing. Thank you. Thank you. Can I move on to Stuart McMillan? Uh, thank you, convener. Right, good morning, uh, panel. Um, just it's an issue of uh, foreign direct investment. I think the the report that's been produced has been very useful. Uh, page sixteen that highlights the. Uh, also, Scotland's uh, success in attracting FDI uh, uh, over the course of the last what, uh, number of years. It gives the example of uh, some 116 new uh, FDI investment projects in Scotland. That's a 7% increase uh, from 2016. Um, can you provide uh, some uh, further detail in terms of uh, the number of jobs that are being created uh, as a consequence of this, but also the, uh, the actual quantum uh, of investment that's uh, come into Scotland? Yeah, so the, the main source we use for looking at inward investment in Scotland is the EY attractiveness survey, and and that's good for giving you the both the number and the volume of projects. It's probably worth saying there's a, there's a kind of there's a stock of FDI in Scotland, and the way to think about that is the the businesses that are owned by non UK operants. So, for instance, we have I think around two thousand six hundred foreign owned. Uh, businesses in Scotland to employ around 330,000. Within those, uh, there's approximately about 1,100 are EU-owned, and they contribute 121,000 jobs to the economy in Scotland. So, so that's the stock. What we've seen from the figures that you've referred to is that Scotland continues to be an attractive place for inward investment. Um, inward investment is really important for the economy, alongside the traditional uh, benefits of the investment, the employment, uh, a, a lot of inward investment that comes to Scotland then exports, also brings benefits to the supply chain. There's also wider benefits around uh, exposing companies to different systems, new management techniques, uh, supply side benefits. So th there's a, there's a recognised value that uh, inward investment uh, largely brings benefits to uh, t to the economy in that guys. W one th thing I would say though is uh, so Scotland's done well in inward investment. Uh, the number of projects uh, competes really well, but we're probably seeing a change in the nature of inward investment coming in. So it tends to be more niche, R and D, data, digital, smaller projects, uh, which which are more which are less. Capital intensive, so less. So, so that's really positive in the sense that Scotland is really attractive for these types of companies, investments, and places to do knowledge-based or R&D digital type work. The flip side of that is, is not being the traditional plants. There's less direct capital investment on the ground. 
So, so I suppose what I'm alluding to is there might be a, the, this type of investment could be more footloose than previous, where you where you invest a substantial amount of uh, of plant. I think in the report we I think we took on from the Bank of England work around their estimates around the potential reduction of inward investment in Scotland being in the order of I think around twenty percent. Yeah. So. Okay. So, uh, thanks for that, Ben. Uh, I understand the, the points you're making, and, but on the issue of the R&D, that's crucial in terms of the businesses going forward. Yeah. Um, I know that's certainly from the electronics industry that I used to work in. That when R&D went, then you knew it was just a matter of time before any assembly and manufacturing went. Uh, and that's uh, obviously that did take place, unfortunately, in Scotland. But just in terms of the, well, you mentioned 20% there. Can you provide some further detail on that, just um, in terms of uh, an ideal Brexit scenario? Yeah, so this, so so in one sense, this goes back to the the EY survey, and they, so they do a survey about the attractiveness of the UK and Scotland, and they look at invest inward investment flows into the EU, and their and their report that was published last year, they're essentially saying that they, they believe the UK has already been impacted by Brexit in terms of uh, inward investors' perceptions of of the attractiveness of the UK as a location. The UK still uh, does really well in the survey. It's the, it's the number one destination for, uh, for inward investment, but there's been some slippage relative to its, its market share, and there's been changes, changes within that. I think, so the, the electronics example you gave is a really good example, actually, of uh, of both the positive and the negatives of inward investment and where it can create an industry. And that was very much an international industry that done really well from Scotland and changes in the market conditions then led to, to that industry no longer uh, b being so strongly based here. But it's, so, so it's, so in the context of, uh, in, in the context of the 20% fall, um, Going back to the analysis about uh, no deal and the impact in terms of access to markets, then essentially the ability to come to Scotland, invest and have frictionless trade across the EU is obviously a big attraction for inward investors. And essentially what the EY report is reflecting is that, that that uncertainty around what the shape of arrangements would be and the potential dislocation is, is creating negative perceptions around the UK and Scotland and and will impact investment flows. So companies' decisions will go go to other places rather than here. Um, so that's that's essentially the rationale behind it. So I mean, this is where uh, one of, or two comments that you've made earlier on I think are extremely important and it ties in with this aspect regarding well the electronics industry has once again been that example. Uh, you stated earlier that uh, the EU exit essentially affects terms of trade. Yeah. And you also, uh, to, to, to Tabby Scott, you touched upon the, the aspect of every government agency uh, will be planning. And uh, this is where, uh, for me, uh, the aspect of, um, of what the Scottish government have been trying to do regarding the, the hubs uh, yeah. opening up, and something that we've discussed in this committee before, uh, the hubs opening up, to try to get that message over to the uh, to the international community that Scotland, even uh, in, a, in a no deal Brexit scenario, that Scotland is very much open for business. And in terms of the the investment hub, in terms of these hubs that that, that are opening up, um, have you seen a, a genuine uh, collective approach uh, from the Scottish government and all the different agencies? to get that message over and to make sure that the, uh, that the activities uh, that are taking place in the hubs uh, are going to be effective to get that message over? Yes, I mean, that's the basis of the hubs, really, to bring together the trade, cultural and wider benefits of Scotland into one place to be marketed much more effectively and to reach out to the business base. So the, the most recent hub was open, I think, a fortnight ago in Paris. Mm. Obviously, it's a really important market for food and drink in Scotland, strong cultural links. And essentially, what the hubs bring together, as you mentioned, is the staff from which traditionally would have been in Scotland Development International, along with uh, broader staff groups, so that there's a clearer articulation of the, the, 
the proposition that Scotland offers across different sectors and markets. And I've certainly seen that working in London and in Dublin as well, where um, having that that concentration in place and connections on the ground can really help businesses either operating there or connections to there or different trades. So it's a, it's an important it's an important start, I think. And finally, uh, how important is it for uh, for government ministers to actually take part in trade missions to help promote and sell Scotland to bring further inward investment into the country? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll not comment on government ministers, but what I'll say is that trade missions and uh, the extent to which you can uh, you, you can help businesses get, get an opportunity in a different market is is the kind of day to day job of governments around the world, and that's why even before the hubs, the Scottish Development International had operations across I think eighteen countries, and uh, in that context, um, anything that helps companies. Uh, through culture, trade, political visits, ministerial visits, is has got to be beneficial to the economy. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, convener. Um, <clears throat> Tony Mackay, in his uh, critique, says, and I quote, that the report is um, very biased and misleading. Uh, it's far too pessimistic assessment and is clearly intended for political purposes. What, what, how would you respond to to that? So I, I would refute that completely. Uh, I think in my opening remarks, uh, I set out the basis of the report based on uh, two years' work, uh, based not solely on our analysis, looking at the UK government, uh, HMT, the National Institute, Standard & Poor's, worked with the Fraser of Allender Institute. Uh, I believe the way it's been set out in the paper is clear. It sets out channels, scenarios, and the ranges uh, the, the ranges are actually m modest compared to other work. The the UK government's own estimates, I think, for the for Scotland in the paper, the analysis that was published suggested uh, no deal would be about eight percent here. So, and the Bank of England's unemployment projections are in the same are, are on the same basis. So, I don't. There's not many. Uh, there's not many academics or independent commentators that are disputing that this would be negative. I think the uncertainty is around how this will actually, uh, what the final form will, of this will be, and that's that's why you've got ranging scenarios. But so I, I'm 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 surprised by that comment, but but I would I stand by my own analysis and work. Yeah, well, thanks very much for that. I mean, I noticed that in your report you ranged from 2.7% to 8.5% reduction in GDP in Scotland by 2030. And interestingly, the report you referred to, I mean, the, the HM government produced implications for Brexit and trade of a no-deal exit on 28th of March 1919 on the 26th of February. And as you so rightly say, what they've suggested is that the range for Scotland is indeed around 8%. Uh, within 15 years, so uh, they seem to be closer to your uh, more pessimistic uh, range, as as, uh, as Mr. Mackay would actually, Professor Mackay would, would, would put it. Now, you talked about some of the kind of uh, organisations that you kind of liaise with. Did you speak to the Institute of Fiscal Studies? Did you have direct uh, conversations with the Treasury itself? Because earlier. And, and, and you, one of your responses, I think, to Tavi Scott, you said that you, ha you hadn't, and I think, what well, you mean, I don't mean to say you personally, but the Scottish Government and others, uh, even the UK Government, perhaps have not heard much from the Bank of England, for example. So I'm wondering h how much broader your, uh, your, um, your, your connections were in terms of addressing this particular issue. Yeah, so, so, so we, we've regular engagement with the Bank of England through their agent in Scotland. Um, and that's primarily on the, their understanding of the economic conditions within Scotland. I think the bank and the work that was published before Christmas have been quite clear around their range of scenarios and impacts. And the governor gave evidence last week at a parliamentary committee, again reinstating their views. In fact, I think he said, if, uh, if I'm back here in June, I think the, their forecast for the UK economy in 2019 are now 1.2%. 
and he, he essentially said if we're, if we're back in June and we've had a no deal exit I'll be coming back with much reduced forecasts and we'll be in a different a different place so so we are aware of the work and the views of the Bank of England through our connections and through the published outputs and essentially we monitor all work that 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 has been done and, and published. Our initial analysis that was published in Scotland's Place in Europe was done independent of anyone else and it was it was done by us but based on a number of work that was done by other uh, informed by work from the OECD, IFS, others around the potential channels and impacts. And we modelled that to that to, to that extent, but I don't, I don't generally get a sense that people are arguing that the immediacy of no deal. And I think the UK government paper uh, last week was really clear in stating that government can't mitigate against this; that no deal would have a severe impact in a number of areas. And essentially, they quote again the the immediacy points around the abrupt nature of the transition, the lapse in trade agreements, the access to market, the late stage for many parties and businesses in preparing for this. Uh, so so that they're all they're all material factors. Nobody's saying uh, that this will be okay. And if it is okay, then there's no clear path about why that would be the case yet. So so at the so it's um, so, so I think there's general consensus with our work. Do you want to come in then? Um, no, the only thing I'd add to that is that we have quite regular engages, engagement on the official level with Treasury, with DEXU, mm -hmm. particularly discussing our analysis and their analysis. So a couple of weeks ago, we had a round table in Scotland discussing analysis of international trade with colleagues from the Department of International Trade, from the Welsh Government, from the Northern Ireland Civil Service. So there's quite a lot of sharing which occurs and takes place in terms of the analytical underpinnings, the models which we use and so on. Yeah, and that's a, that, that's a point I should have probably made. There's a general consistency in the methodology and approaches that are that are being used uh, for the models. So w we use a computable general equilibrium model. The UK have got a similar model which they're using, and not and the the types of assumptions and how those models respond to the types of shocks are broadly similar, and that's why you get the what I would call call a kind of broad consensus of of the results um, in, that, in that regard. Yeah, I mean, one of the things you've also mentioned is that you're concerned about, uh, you know, CPI uh, inflation uh, significantly increasing, um, possibly because of uh, the impact of sterling um, depreciation, among other issues. I wonder if you can talk a bit more about the impact on interest rates, uh, potential int uh, uh, impact on interest rates and also inflation of a, of a no deal uh, Brexit. Yeah, certainly. So I think in the report, again, we set out some assumptions around inflation, and that's based on the Bank of England work around where they see inflation going in terms of a no deal. And essentially, I think it's an increase to between 4 and 6% or whatever from from its uh, current levels. So, so in thinking about why would you see rise in inflation, essentially, uh, with sterling depreciating, import costs would rise and we would see that coming through uh, a number of goods. You may also see some price rises across sectors as the costs of delay or additional costs are passed on to consumers from businesses. So you would see you would see an increase in inflation driven primarily through sterling depreciation and increased costs of uh, imported goods. Obviously inflation reduces people's purchasing power and I would put a squeeze on on household uh, finances. The, the, the link to interest rates, in a sense, is, again, in the paper from earlier Bank of England work, they projected where they thought interest rates would need to be to match higher inflation levels. Uh, our own view, which was published a couple of weeks ago, was we thought that the immediate response would be expansionary monetary policy in the, in the, in the space of a shock. And interest rates, if anything, would likely come down immediately, both to support the banks and others are in terms of uh, maintaining confidence in the economy. And the governor last week, uh, I think, gave an equal probability to interest rates uh, uh, coming down as well. There's, 
So, so, so essentially, what, what the monetary situation we're in at the minute is a legacy from the last financial crisis. We've still got really low interest rates, and essentially, there's an expectation at some point that th those will tighten and come back to what would be a, a more normal level. But in the in the advent of a shock of this scale, we would expect to see um, expansionary support from the bank and others in terms of monetary policy, and. I suppose, in a sense, the the bank's target inflation rate of around two percent. They have a wider remit of around supporting the economy, and they would see that as a as a, a kind of one-off price level adjustment. And I don't think they would they would respond to that in the traditional way. But but that's that, that's part of the part of the response and part of the adjustment. I mean. You've mentioned, obviously, that uh, that uh, there, there could be a real impact in certain sectors of the economy, such as agriculture. And the, the Treasury's report, for example, talks about potential um, uh, EU tariffs of 70% on beef and 45% on lamb exports and 10% on automotive vehicles. But one area that's not really been touched on, to, uh, and it's obviously huge from Scotland in terms of its contribution to the Scottish economy and employment, is the financial sector. Um, I mean, the Treasury has basically said that... Uh, that um, what the EU is doing is, um, and I quote, the Commission has stated that it is only focusing on areas of its self-interest for EU financial stability and that any decisions taken may be conditional and time-limited. And they go on to say that the absence of action by EU authorities to mitigate risks in some areas of financial services, there could be some disruption. How, how concerned is the Scottish Government about the impact on our financial services sector and employment thereof and its ability to continue to, to trade effectively with the European partners? Yeah, so it's, it's a really important <coughs> sector and it's one of the sectors that's identified uh, that would be impacted by no deal on the regulatory basis in a sense that the... Uh, <coughs> The legal and regulatory framework at the minute allows financial firms to passport across Europe at the minute. And essentially, I think what the UK government paper says that that you can have uh, a term called equivalence, which, which essentially recognises the mutual uh, regulatory environment of both countries that would allow some form of this to continue. But the UK, papers, the UK government's paper saying that's unlikely to be in place by... Uh, by the 29th of March. So what that would imply is, in a sense, that the ability of financial firms, uh, financial sector firms in Scotland to service EU markets uh, will be impacted. Um, and in, in that context, uh, we, we know that financial sector in Scotland, uh, through the banks, through different operations, have looked at how they can continue to, to both manage money from within the EU and also support their customers out with through op through op opening um, opening or using European banking licences in other places. So it is it's it is one and I think it's one of the areas that's probably underestimated about the importance of services and actually of the four freedoms, the ability for uh, legal professionals, other professionals to trade from Scotland across the, the, the EU is really important. And that ability to passport and deliver services is likely to be impacted almost overnight. So the, the EU is, is quite different in the sense that um, the, the, the four freedoms have been in place since 1992, but the services side of it is really quite unusual to have that ability to trade services across across countries on the basis that exists at the moment. There's there's very few trade deals in the world that, that allow that, and the financial services sector has obviously benefited from that and and would be impacted. Okay, and finally, convener. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yes, yeah, sure. I'm just uh, I, I actually the cross party group in life sciences, and there was a presentation there from uh, Glaxo Smith Klein, who said that their company, which employs 14,000 people in the UK, has spent 70 million pounds on Brexit preparations, and that's 5,000 pounds ahead. That's money that's not going into everything from investment to salaries. What has been the impact on investment by Scottish and indeed uh, UK companies, um, you know, uh, through having to di divert? Um, resources into preparation for Brexit. Okay, I, I'll be I'll be brief, and then I'll let Simon come in as well. So, so companies are already transitioning at the moment, and and trying to prepare to mitigate. 
we, we published work earlier last year around <coughs> the impact of stockpiling. So we're seeing that's a, an evident thing where we're seeing businesses increasing the inventories that they can hold to mitigate Im immediate disruptions. So essentially, that's skewing working capital towards holding more stock, and and it's a, it's just a transitory effect. So that's that's. Uh, that's one particular impact. We're also seeing that where investment's taking place, it's skewed towards supply chain issues or additional warehousing or wholesaling around Brexit preparedness. So that, in a sense, your example is, is borne out by other examples. What we're also seeing is that businesses are holding cash, that they're postponing investment, and that they're, uh, if not quite bunkering down, they're waiting to see how this how this uh, responds. And even on the Purchase and Managers Index, I think for February, had inventories were at record highs since the series began. So that whole thing around people stockpiling. So so there's, de there's definitely different behaviour in the business community. Do you want to say anything about the investment numbers? Um, yes. So I think what we're seeing is two things happening with the investment figures for Scotland and for the UK. Firstly, overall growth in business investment in the UK is really low just now, the lowest in the G7, and it's really slumped the last four quarters or so. And that, I expect, primarily because companies are holding fire, waiting for the uncertainty to resolve. So partly we're seeing far lower investment figures. The second thing we're seeing is that of the investment which is occurring, as Gary mentioned, a lot of that is around Brexit mitigation at present, rather than growth enhancing investment which would drive future growth and entering future markets. So it's really the investment we are seeing just now is to sort of mitigate the risks as companies see it, rather than to try and boost future output in the future. So obviously that's a short term impact on the economy, but clearly if that is sustained with business investment being low for longer term, that will feed through to longer productivity growth, and that's partly why some of the long-term Brexit analysis is so negative. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 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 Jamie Green, please. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning, uh, gentlemen. Um, just referring back to uh, uh, some of the evidence we received from uh, Professor Mackay, and I appreciate that you know you may have some differences of opinion. Uh, he did uh, also in his submission praise many aspects of the work that you've done as well, and I think that's to be noted and appreciated as well. But point 17 uh, in his submission paper too has uh, struck me as it's quite an interesting comment. He said, there is little attempt to explain the recent poor performance of the Scottish economy. Instead, there's a, often a very selective choice of statistics. Now, reading section three of your paper, Scotland's recent economic performance, would you say this is a fair... Uh, balanced and unbiased view of Scottish re economic recent performance? Yes, certainly. So the, the, let me let me just explain a little bit around on, on these points. So I, I publish an independent state of the economy three to four times a year. Um, and in the last one, which I published around two weeks ago, I kind of the key messages I was articulate, articulating was that Scotland's economy in 2018 was stronger than the two previous years that it would record growth probably around 1.5%, that we had a labour market that was performing back at rec record levels. And actually the context for those comments was based on the, the impact of the oil and gas sector through 2016 and 17, which I'd covered in previous analysis in the report. Uh, we know that the, that the impact had a severe impact in the sector in Scotland through that period. And actually, part of the positive narrative around Scotland's economy coming back was the fact that that sector had been th through quite a transition for two years. I mean, that sector's probably quite a good example of, for some of the arguments about uh, kind of international trade and open sector, there's one price for that sector. It's a, do a dollar price. And when the, the, the price falls from over $100 to, to $50, then the sector has to respond. That was a two-year response we've seen. And we've seen, and that was, our analysis also showed the impact of that sector in terms of its its impact in GDP, production, services. So, 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 it's, so our analysis is clear. And I think if you look back through the different reports, the one from a couple of weeks ago, 
was focusing on the big issue and the big risk for the economy at the moment, and I was highlighting the the potential dislocation from no deal Brexit across those sectors. So, the alongside the state of the economy reports, we publish monthly economic statistics. We we our analysis is open and and transparent, and um, so I'm perfectly comfortable with what, what we do and how we okay. set it out. So, okay, I, I appreciate all the the work that you do uh, on continuous basis analysis and uh, analysing the economy. But why in your paper, why did you choose not to compare uh, the Scottish economy to the rest of the UK's? On what basis? Uh, on any basis. So I think, so in the, let me be clear, in the state of the econ economy report. In this that, report, we're talking about this report today. Oh, sorry, this report. Yeah. So which, which it's section titled Scotland's recent economic performance. There's no mention of any comparative analysis between the recent performance of Scotland's economy versus that of the rest of the UK. And my asked question is why? OK, so, so that's the, the report that I published two weeks ago? It's the one that the session's about. Yeah, OK, that's fine. So, so it's simply because it's Scotland's report we're doing and it's the impact of Scotland. In the report the week before, we have uh, all of our analysis starts with the global economy, UK economy, Scotland, and we provide the same comparators for each. And our, so our focus obviously is in Scotland. It's the analysis of this report was trying to provide a backdrop for Scotland relative to how an ODO would impact. But surely that effect of what would happen in an ODO scenario, what you're doing here is building up a case is to paint a picture of where the economy is at the moment. And presumably that would require looking at Scotland's performance as it stands at the moment, whether there's Brexit or no Brexit, deal or no deal, hard Brexit or no, no hard Brexit. So, for example, you've completely missed out any uh, of the analysis done by the Scottish Fiscal Commission in your piece of work, uh, which looks at uh, GDP growth over the next five years. It doesn't do any comparison on productivity levels in Scotland versus the rest of the UK. So what I'm saying is that you're setting the scene as to what might happen next, no. but you clearly haven't painted a picture of how it is at the moment. So again, I think we're I think we're probably splitting hairs here over different papers. The the so this was essentially about no deal implications for Scotland, and the focus of it was around the scenario transmission mechanisms and how that would impact the economy. Your points around the the, the underlying performance of the economy, they were all covered in the report the week before, which included forecasts from the Fiscal Commission, uh, from other independent. Uh, organisations like the Fraser of Allender, included OBR forecasts, included the most recent productivity data, labour market data, all, all of that was there. So I suppose I'll accept that we could have we could have made the report maybe 10 pages longer and reproduced all of that analysis. But the point of this report was really about the immediacy and impact of no deal on the economy rather than... OK, can I refer to a, a, a section of your yeah. report then, page 16? It says, the lack of clarity for Brexit beyond March 19 is already starting to have an impact on key economic indicators for Scotland. Can you tell me what those are? Yes, so what we are seeing is we've just touched on investment. We've touched on investment being skewed. We're seeing that, that uh, firms are responding to this, are transient this, but I think the point... So what, what are the key economic indicators? So, so I'm looking key, at what, I, what I want to hear so the, is what effect is it having on GDP, productivity, employment levels, the key economic indicators that most yeah. econo economists use yeah. to, so, to, to analyse the economy? So we, we, don't, we haven't published uh, GDP for Q4 yet, but if you look at the UK publication, December for the UK economy, uh, GDP growth is slowed, I think, to 0.1. So that, and that was... That was uh, based on their analysis of uncertainty to do with Brexit. What we are mentioning in this report, in a sense, is what we are seeing is a material drop in confidence in January and February that's coming through. And which yeah. statistic are you using for that? So we, ha we, we have a survey, a uh, Scottish uh, sentiment survey, which, which uh, surveys 2,000 households, and we're seeing a drop in sentiment across that. Okay, so across when you when piece. you make a broad brush statement like the lack of clarity over Brexit is already starting to have an impact on key economic indicators, the only statistic that you've provided is a household survey of 2,000 people in Scotland. No. It's not exactly a key economic indicator, is it? No, I think confidence is a massive indicator and actually it's really important. It's really important to think about what we're hearing from the business base as well and what we're hearing. 
uh, and so the, the analysis that we did last year, uh, looking at the impact of uncertainty investment, uh, of uncertainty investment on investment, suggested that the essentially we know this from our engagement with the banks and sectors. Businesses aren't investing on the same basis at the moment. That uncertainty is there. Where companies are investing, they're investing to, uh, in issues around mitigation, the efficiency of the operation, not not in the context of of the economy. And there's a wider backdrop to the economy as well in terms of the global and UK economy. So uh, the so I, I'm clear in the sense that the, we we are seeing impacts on the economy of that, but. The, the interesting point you make, in a sense, is this is against a backdrop of uh, record record low unemployment levels, uh, demand for services, and some of that is Brexit related as well. Where you could have actually firms not investing in new equipment, capital, but employing people more uh, at this time due to the uncertainty. Presumably, higher employment levels is a positive. Yes, yes, certainly. Good. Uh, can I talk about migration briefly? Um, just referring to your section, uh, pages 25, 26, labour market and migration. Can you just uh, explain to me uh, some of the assumptions you've made around your modelling for that? Um, you talk about uh, a net migration fall between 15, 16, 16, 17. Uh, can you give me the reasons why there was a fall? So, I'll, I'll, you can come in on this, but so, so the... So, so migration, in a sense, the, the reasons for the fall are quite clear in the sense that we have data around the inflows of people into Scotland. And w when we did this modelling and the earlier analysis, we took both the, the, the central proje projections from Register Scotland around the migrants and high and low migrant scenarios. So, so if the question is why would you expect... No, what? I'm asking, you said there was a fall in inward yeah. migration. My, my, my question to you is what were the reasons for the fall? What, what, what do you think the reasons for the fall were? So, so the reasons for the fall will be, uh, I think, perceptions of openness, perceptions of willingness to stay here, okay. perceptions so that's of That's not what it says in your document. It says on the back of improving economic conditions elsewhere in the EU. Yeah, What's sorry, that got to do well, with perception of so I think welcomeness? Well, so what we were saying was that mig net migration to Scotland fell between 1516 and 1617. That was partly because sterling depreciated 18% over that period, right. which is what the previous page discusses. Okay. And that means, obviously, when people repatriate their wages, they're worth less when you put them back into euros. So that was partly what it was about. Secondly, what we saw over that period was partly a slowdown in Scotland's economy, which is oil-related, but at the same time, the wider euro economy was recovering. So Scotland's relative attractiveness, as it were, to the right. migrants okay. was a bit less. And thirdly, as Gary says, I think probably wider perceptions on the back of the EU referendum probably also didn't impact for some EU migrants as well. And in your modelling, looking at a no-deal scenario, which is what this conversation is about, have you done any uh, modelling of increased non-EU migration when looking at labour market forecasts? Not specifically, but it's actually the way that so you made no assumptions no, there would be an increase in non-EU no. migration? The way, so, so essentially, what we are talking about is a, a net migrant figure. So the, the, the number of migrants coming out of the Scottish economy from both sources is 13,000. If you have a reduction in that, what we are simulating is the impact of a reduction in migration. The source of the migration of where the people come from is, is, is less of an issue. It's the, the impact's the same. And it would be the same if you were increasing migration. So we, we don't... You didn't model that. OK. Pause now, is it? Could I ask are one the, last final short uh, question? If it's very if it's brief, very brief. Um, So time. can I ask you then, given, given everything that, that you've talked about in your, in your document and all the conversation we're having around the potential for no deal scenario, what do you think would be the best thing that could happen on the 29th of March? The, the best thing in what context? Given the discussion around how terrible a no-deal Brexit would be. Well, it would be for no. answer well, that chief, question. Chief Economic Advisor to the Government, you'd like to um, think you had a view on it. <laughs> well, I, I think all, all I would say is that... Uh, would transition be helpful, for example? No, certainly transition would be helpful. And all I would say is that no-deal brings an immediacy of impacts and abruptness 
which uh, which is the, the catalyst for some of these these impacts. So, and and that's confirmed in the UK paper. Not consensual note, thank you. Um, I will allow Annabel Ewing a brief yes, question. Thank you. It can be just really a point of information which I thought might be helpful to the committee and which Mr Green may not have been aware of in terms of his discussion on the Scottish versus UK economy and the relative strengths. In fact, uh, this morning, HMRC published figures which showed that Scotland's goods exports increased by 6% in 2018, double the rate for the UK as a whole. So that might just be helpful information in terms of the context of the comparison between the two economies. Thank you. Okay, I think this, this, I think this Ewing has made her point that she wished to make this, this morning. Well, now uh, I'd like to thank the witnesses uh, for coming to the session, um, to Dr Gillespie and Simon Fuller. Um, it's been a privilege to... Could I have some order, please, in the committee? Um, it's been a privilege to convene the committee this morning. Uh, Joan McAlpine, who is our convener, gives her apologies and regrets that she was unable to be here this morning to take part in the evidence session. Um, I'll now move into private session. Thank you.